The third most commonly diagnosed cancer worldwide affects this structure that you can see here called the colon. Now, obviously it is very unfortunate for anyone to get diagnosed with cancer, but colon cancer is one of the most preventable cancers if caught early. So it's definitely heartbreaking when somebody dies from this. And we even have a body in our lab that died of colon cancer that we'll take a look at. We'll also talk about how colon cancer develops and if it results in symptoms, what puts you at risk for developing this type of cancer and the best prevention strategies with a twist. Because I recently got a colonoscopy and I was filmed right after I came out of it in my loopy state, where I apparently wanted to talk to my YouTube audience about how effective I felt the procedure was, as well as some extra bonus info. It's definitely going to be a loopy one. So let's jump into this anatomical awesomeness. So what is the actual colon? Well, the colon makes up the majority of the large intestine. And you can see we've got a large intestine on the tray here, oriented about how it would be closely sitting in your own body. Here's this tube coming off over here. That's the small intestine. You can see, kind of just move those guts out of the way here because normally the small intestine would be in the central lower portion of the abdomen, but we wanted to view the colon in its entirety with no distractions. But the colon, is kind of like the picture frame of the abdominal cavity. At least that's kind of how I think of it. It starts in the right lower quadrant, comes up here, across, down, and then squiggles down and out. But let's talk about the specific structures that make up the large intestine. The first part is this bag-like structure here called the cecum. Now normally, the appendix should be coming off of the cecum, but it was removed from this body. Then we come up to the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, hooking up to the straight rectum, which will then hook up to the anal canal. But you can kind of see why often people will refer to the large intestine as the colon, because the majority of it is the colon, which we have the ascending, transverse, descending, and then the sigmoid. Now, the main function of the large intestine is to absorb the last part of water and salt. So as stuff, or what we'll say stool or feces, is moving through the large intestine, it's having the water and the electrolytes or salts being pulled out of it. Now we also know that the large intestine has a whole bunch of different bacteria in there that we refer to as our microbiome. And kind of a cool little function of the microbiome, at least one of the functions, is that those bacteria, some of the metabolic byproducts of those bacteria are certain B vitamins and even vitamin K. And those can also be absorbed into the colon and therefore be utilized by your body. Now colon cancer, which is sometimes also referred to as colorectal cancer, when it also includes the rectum, usually starts with mutations in the cells that line the inside of the colon. And the inside lining is referred to as the tunica mucosa, which you can actually see here, if I get my finger in there and kind of open it up and bring it closer to you, that inside lining, the tunica mucosa, that's essentially where the cancer typically will start. Now, since we are looking at the inside of the colon here, we should probably address something. Sometimes when people discuss what happens when somebody passes away, they talk about how that person poops or defecates. Now, that can get blown out of proportion a bit. Yes, the stool that's at the very end within the anal canal, some of that will be expelled from the body potentially because when the external anal sphincter relaxes, that can allow some of that stool to pass out. But it's not like there's this massive impulse from the autonomic nervous system that causes this massive wave of peristalsis throughout the whole large intestine and just shoots out all the remaining stool that's occupying the whole large intestine. That just doesn't happen. Anybody who's ever prepped for a colonoscopy knows that it takes a bit of work to clear all the stool from the large intestine. And this whole discussion might make you be thinking of another question, like, Jonathan, if all of the stool doesn't completely come out of the large intestine during death, what happened to the rest of the stool or feces that was in this particular large intestine? Well, I had to clean it out. And I'm not gonna give you every little detail of how I did that. That's behind the scenes cadaver lab stuff. But just know, due to those efforts, you now have a squeaky clean colon that you can have for your viewing pleasure. But again, colon cancer usually starts in this inner lining. Most cases begin when initial genetic mutations trigger abnormal cell growth in the colon's epithelial cells leading to the formation of small, non-cancerous growths called polyps. Think of these as little mushroom-like bumps on the colon wall. Now, not all polyps turn cancerous, but certain types like adenomatous polyps, 
have the potential to progress if additional mutations accumulate over time. These subsequent mutations mess with the normal cell cycle, and cells that should divide in a controlled way start growing out of control, ignoring signals to stop or die off. The cancer can then invade deeper layers of the colon wall, spread to nearby lymph nodes, and eventually metastasize to distant organs, like the liver or lungs. And that's exactly what happened with this particular body. The cancer started in the colon and then eventually spread to the liver, which ultimately led to the death of this body. Normally a liver is a pretty smooth brownish organ, but this one is enlarged with cancerous nodules. Now, the early stages of colon cancer are often symptom free, but as it progresses, you might notice blood in the stool, changes in bowel habits like persistent diarrhea or constipation, abdominal pain, unexplained weight loss, or fatigue from anemia. But who's at risk for developing this type of cancer? Well, age is a big risk factor as about 90% of cases occur in people over 50 years old. But alarmingly, rates are rising in younger adults under 55. And why is that? Well, it isn't completely certain, but many experts are pointing to shifts in lifestyle. Other risk factors include a family history of colon cancer or certain genetic conditions like Lynch syndrome or familial adenomatous polyposis, which can make polyps form early and often. But coming back to some of the specific lifestyle factors that it can increase your risk, because these are things we can actually have some control over. And these risk factors or lifestyle risk factors include things like diets that are high in processed meats or low in fiber. Obesity and smoking are also risk factors, as well as heavy alcohol use, and even a sedentary lifestyle can increase your odds. Inflammatory bowel conditions like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis also up the risk because chronic inflammation can lead to those cellular mutations that we talked about earlier. But here's the good news. Prevention and early detection is totally doable, starting with screenings like colonoscopies. Colonoscopies are recommended starting at age 45 for those that are at average risk, or earlier if you have a family history of colon cancer or other specific risk factors. Colonoscopies can actually prevent cancer by removing polyps on the spot. There are also other tests like the stool-based fecal immunochemical tests, which can be used to test for hidden blood in the stool, and so therefore can be utilized as a screening tool. But as I mentioned, I recently had a colonoscopy done on myself. I didn't do it myself, obviously, I had somebody else do it, but I did go in a few years early because how dare you think that I'm already 45, but I went in for this a little early because I had some other things going on. And I had some thoughts to share afterwards about the effectiveness of this screening tool. This is important for you to posterity. Is that right? My YouTube videos, viewers be considered YouTube posterity or just YouTube friends. But health is very important. The screening. With a little scope in the anus. It passes through the external anal sphincter, moves into the anus, then the rectum, then the sigmoid colon, the descending colon, the transverse colon, the ascending colon, and the cecum. That's pretty sad that I know the anatomy when I spread juice box on me, I squeezed. That's pretty nerdy when you know anatomy when you're sedated. I always tell my students, when you start dreaming of anatomy, you know you're in trouble in a good way. But when you start dreaming of it accurately, that's even worse, but in the best way possible. Because you know your best screening tool for colon cancer. Going up my colon in the reverse direction scanning for polyps and colon cancer. And I'd really like to know if I have polyps or any hemorrhoids. It's like, in some ways, and in other ways, one way it's very non-invasive because there's no cutting, and very accurate procedure. But in other ways, it might feel invasive because it's going up your external anal sphincter through the anal canal. 
I highly recommend it as a training tool. <sighs> what do you guys think of screening tools like colonoscopies? Leave it in the comments below. <laughs> Who says that anymore? Most YouTubers aren't like, Write it in the comments below. But it is nice to interact with them. Some people are very nice in the comments. And then there's the bots that have emerged, which are so annoying. I have to go through at the beginning of the release of every YouTube video and delete the porno bots. Why do they have to do that? It's tainting our educational content. There are some people who are kind of mean, but that's okay. They might be 15 year olds in their mom's basement, so I shouldn't judge. And people get really mad about our sponsors sometimes. I really try to work hard to vet sponsors, honey. <laughs> oh. So hopefully that provided some entertainment at my expense, and you are definitely more than welcome to tease me in the comments below. And just as an FYI, I did not have any polyps, so good news there. However, they did discover an internal hemorrhoid, which is probably too much information to share with the YouTube world, but I'm not ashamed. But I do want to finish this up with one last serious thing. And for those of you that have been watching our channel for a while, you may have noticed over the last year we've been doing more cancer-related videos. And during a lot of those videos, we keep talking about this idea of early detection, screening tools, and the importance of utilizing screening tools and detecting cancer early. And the reason why that is so important is because most people that get diagnosed with cancer don't typically die from the primary cancer. The primary cancer being where the cancer first starts or originates. And in the case of today, that cancer started in the colon of the cadaver that I showed you earlier, but then spread to a secondary or metastasized to a secondary site like the liver. And that's what ultimately led to the death of the body. And yes, there are a handful of primary cancers that people will die from before they need to spread anywhere, like primary brain cancer, pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, but you can live without a testicle. Somebody can live without an ovary. You can remove breast tissue that has cancerous cells in it. You can remove the colon that has cancerous cells on it. You can remove multiple tissues if you catch them early enough. But if you catch it too late and that primary cancer has spread to a more vital organ, that again is typically what most people who get cancer die from because it's spread or metastasized to a secondary site. So again, early detection is so important for cancer screening. So don't miss out on your annual physicals. Talk to your primary care provider about your family history, your risk factors, so that you can kind of assess when you need to utilize these screening tools. Because we want you to live anatomically awesome for as long as possible. I've been teaching anatomy for about 18 years now. I know, I'm kind of getting old. But during that time period, I've noticed that students will sometimes jump between different resources like YouTube, Quizlet, textbooks, and apps. And sometimes all that jumping around can be a little overwhelming. So that's why we put together the Anatomy and Physiology Mega Bundle. It's basically a collection of study materials like quizzes that go with the videos, illustrated guides, medical atlases, flashcards, and a full course on the foundations of human anatomy. The helpful part is that everything references the same content and shows how anatomy relates to physiology, pathology, and medicine. So instead of just blindly memorizing the structures that make up the heart, these study guides help you to apply this information to the real world, like what's going on during a heart attack, or what happens when a heart valve doesn't work properly. So if you're a student looking for something that'll help you pass anatomy, or if you're a parent trying to help your kids survive pre-med or nursing school, check the link in the description below. We're running a special discount for a limited time, and we're also offering exclusive access to our latest course on myology, or the muscular system, as part of the anatomy and physiology mega bundle.